All right. Well, while the counter is still clicking upwards, um, I will start by once again welcoming all of you to this, I think now third, third, right? Yeah. Third um, session of Dialogues in Jain Studies in Europe, uh, which is co-organized um, between University of Birmingham, which is Marie-Hélène, who we will see on your screen somewhere, uh, University of Ghent, which is where I work, and Arihanta Institute, represented today by Chris, whom you all will know. Um, I'm really excited to um, be able to welcome you guys already in a third successful session. Um, I'm going to sort of you know jump to the conclusion that it will be successful, because how else, what what are the other options, really? Um, the idea of this series is to sort of foster and create conversations and connections between people working on Jain studies in different parts of Europe. Um, and we're kind of curating dialogues by inviting two speakers and a moderator who work on a specific topic each time. And the subject of today is collections. Um, so we will have two speakers, you are very welcome to type comments and questions in the chat, um, which will then be picked up after the two speakers are finished. Now, before handing it over, you will see on your screen, essentially a, the website of this series with the event of um, today, um, well, before you, and you see that lovely button register now. So also for future sessions, the next will be in February, um, you can go to this website and press register. Um, you will then be allotted um, the uh, the link to join the webinar um, by email. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over first to Maria Langoris of University of Birmingham, who will say a few words on today's um, topic specifically. Thank you very much, Tina. And good evening and good morning also, everybody, uh, depending on from where you are joining us. So I'm thrilled today to introduce indeed this third session of our lecture series with once more a theme that has a real special significance for the field of Jaina studies. So I will keep it under two minutes uh, and I will just I'll just throw uh, like that to, to all of you for, for future uh, reflections, three examples of the importance of discussing today this question of collections and of the transmission of books uh, on which actually a non-negligible part of our scholarship relies. So those, those three examples are, are those ones. So in a 2014 book chapter on Indian manuscripts, uh, Dominic Vujastic brings our awareness on the fact that there are millions of uncatalogued manuscripts in South Asia, most being from the uh, 1820 and 30s. And that the future survival of this Indian literary and intellectual heritage depends on the discovery and the conservation and the preservation and on the reproduction by digital means of this very last generation of manuscripts. And this as soon as we can, since several hundreds of them are being destroyed or become illegible every week. So that's the first example. The second is that these past years, a whole generation of giants in China studies left us. The 2021 edition of the newsletter of the Center of China Studies uh, from London was especially bitter in this regard, with the obituaries of no less than uh, William Bolle, Marcus Bonk, William Johnson, Kenneth Roy Norman, uh, Sagarma Jain, Padmanab Jaini also. And since then, we all know that more joined them, and we were especially saddened to add to the list our dear friend and colleague Paul Dundas, who was not from this generation. And so this made many of us questions the modality of legacy of these private libraries uh, of scholars. The third aspect, uh, final note, concerns the development of academic chairs funded by giant philanthropists. This development brings into the forefront a question that is a challenging one, but that is also genuinely meaningful, as it also expands our mission 
as scholars in new interesting ways. This is the question of the articulation of the academic and of the religious projects. And these questions also concerns the constitution of one's collection. Which book should we integrate in our public collections? So here are a few things, a few aspects of the importance of this question today. And there is so much more to say about that. Uh, and this is why um, we have all these fantastic speakers with us tonight, to whom I will give the floor now. Uh, and I will be very much looking forward to our discussions uh, also afterwards. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Marie Elaine. It gives me great pleasure tonight to introduce Dr. Johannes Belz at Museum Rietberg here in Zurich. Johannes Belz studied theology, Indian studies, and religious studies at the universities of Halle, Strasbourg, Paris, and Lausanne. On numerous occasions throughout the 1990s, he undertook research in India for his PhD thesis. From 1999 to 2002, he worked at the renowned South Asia Institute of the University of Heidelberg before taking up a post at the Museum Rietberg, where he currently is now, where he's the curator of the collection of Indian bronzes, sculptures, and textiles, and of the Southeast Asian collection. He's chaired the museum's curatorial board since 2009 and was appointed assistant director in 2016. In addition, Johannes has lectured regularly at the University of Zurich and the Zurich University of Teacher Education since 2005. Johannes is the author of a number of books, edited volumes, scholarly articles, and public publications. For example, he is the author of the 2005 book, Mahar, Buddhist and Dalit, Religious Conversion and Sociopolitical Emancipation. His work has featured the work of B.R. Ambedkar, who, as we know, is one of the major figures of what has come to be known as engaged Buddhism. Now, among many other things, Johannes has also overseen the Museum Rietberg's Jain art collection. More recently, he organized and co-curated the well-known exhibition in 2022 and 2023 titled being Jain, which has a nice rhyme to it in German, Jain sein. The exhibition featured objects from Museum Rietberg's collection with roots in the earlier pioneering work of former museum director, director Eberhard Fischer. It also featured borrowed Jain objects, which Johannes negotiated with the government of India in a very thought provoking and entertaining interactive game of questions reflecting the well-known board game, Snakes and Ladders. Central to this recent and very successful exhibition at Museum Rietberg was Johannes's direct engagement with the local Swiss and global Jain communities, including with our very own Arihanta Institute. I also had the great pleasure of collaborating with Johannes on a number of initiatives for the exhibition and even had the chance to give a guest lecture in his related course at the University of Zurich. Johannes, of course, returned the favor and recently guest lectured for my course here at Arihanta Institute in uh, Jain philosophy. Finally, he is also currently contributing a chapter to our forthcoming co-edited volume, Engage Jainism, where he highlights many of the challenges and potentials of curating a Jain exhibition in direct engagement with the Jain community in Switzerland and globally. Johannes, I am grateful to you for all of our ongoing collaborative work over the years, and I thank you for agreeing to preside as our senior scholar over this session for us. It's an honor to have you here. And I will now turn over the microphone to you to introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Johannes. Thank you very much, Chris, for this extended introduction. And um, before I introduce you to our first speaker this evening, I would like to um, comment on something which just um, came to my mind when you introduced this evening's lecture. You know, Johannes, sorry to interrupt you. Um, did you know that your camera is off? Um, or did you intend to have it? How did that happen? Well, it, it, it was... We can... There okay, you. sorry. Okay. Sorry. It was just, I think... Oh, good. So, um, one well, one thought which uh, I would might we might, might like to, to, to discuss after is that um, we, call, we, we talk about collections this evening. And we have two um, speakers who talk about manuscripts, right? And about, so, and uh, your introduction, Marie Helene, was it's, it's about manuscripts, it's about books. And so I would like to, to add here that when we talk about collections, material culture of, of, of Jainism um, means much more than, than, than books and manuscripts. And I think. We often tend, as you know, being specialists of, of you know religious studies, to look on texts. But I would like to maybe 
during this this conversation also um you know bring in the non-text material world of 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 giant culture so, <clears throat> so having said that i would like to introduce our first speaker this evening jean petit who is the curator in charge of the south and southeast collections asia's collections at the um national library of france um in paris which is for those who do not know the major institution library in france so if you know and not only collecting manuscripts but their paintings persian paintings indian so in almost all exhibitions we do um on on asian uh, on asian art the the uh, bibliothèque nationale uh, that's in, in point of reference and i'm so pleased to introduce you to have you here this evening jerome jerome petit has um a large list of publications and uh, academic and, and non-academic and books um on on different areas of of giant studies and uh, translations um and i would like to 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 mention also that he has been uh, which i think is something very very um important to me having a lot of reviews on on on, on books and this i think this tradition of reviewing other writings that's something i observe in the contemporary academic world is getting less and less visible and uh, i i'm you know, part of the old school tradition. I, I really like this and I appreciate that. That makes it so interesting to read what you say about someone else writing. So, and um, I am I came to know that you are also professor for Indian manuscript cultures at the Ecole Pratique du Institute in Paris, where I had the honor and the pleasure to, to, to study and do my PhD long ago. And we both, had the same teacher, so I was also, you know, learning a little bit of Prakrit with uh, Nalini Balbir. So I'm extremely pleased to have you here this evening, and that you share some of your, you know, experience and knowledge with us. So thank you for Jerome for being with us, and I hand over to you directly. Please. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Johannes, for this uh, introduction. Um, uh, so I will share my screen. Um, can you see? Okay. Yes. So thank you. Thank you very much. I'm also old fashioned and I love to review uh, books of others. <laughs> I think it's the, yeah, it's the way uh, the, the ideas uh, circulate the better between, between us and um, uh, it is also uh, an exercice de style that I uh, appreciate mm -hmm. particularly. Um, I would also like to thank uh, Marie-Hélène Goris for her invitation to participate in this uh, very uh, interesting webinar series and uh, Christopher Miller for uh, everything he does to uh, make this possible in such a, such a perfect way. So the, the National Library of France uh, keeps a collection of uh, 4,000 manuscripts uh, originating from uh, South Asia. It is the oldest uh, collections of Indian manuscripts in Europe. Uh, the heart of the collection is the sending of uh, manuscripts from Bengal and Pondicherry made by the Jesuit fathers in the 1730s to the library of the French king, uh, Louis XV. Uh, the collection uh, then continued to grow uh, through our purchases and uh, donations from enlightened military men and travelers in the 18th century, from scientific missions in the 19th century, and from personal collection of scholars in the 20th uh, century. Uh, some uh, sporadic buying are still uh, made today. Uh, the lines of strength of the collections uh, are a Sanskrit literature in all the fields uh, covered uh, by the language, uh, Veda, Purana, uh, grammar, philosophy, uh, but also Tamil and Telugu classical literature, uh, pre-modern Bengali uh, poetry, Marathi devotional poetry, and so on. Uh, the collection also includes 
uh, precisely 377 um, Jaina manuscripts. If we consider the manuscripts uh, that contain uh, Jaina works and uh, the manuscripts that uh, were copied in a Jaina a milieu or a scriptorium. So, uh, before going into uh, more detail, I would like to, to give you a few milestones concerning the, the acquisition of Jaina manuscripts. Uh, the first ones to enter the National Library were uh, those collected by Anquetil Duperon. Uh, this important Indologist made a stay in uh, Surat, uh, Gujarat, in order to learn her uh, ancient uh, languages of both the Veda and the Avesta. Uh, in the mid uh, 18th century. He used uh, the lexicographical works of Hemachandra uh, as a tool to learn Sanskrit at a time when uh, philological dictionaries did not exist. In the mid 19th century, uh, Charles Dochoa, a young and promising Indologist who died at 30 years old, uh, laid a scientific mission to collect materials to write a history of uh, Indian literature. In his quest, he had a keen attention to non brahmanical traditions, the Bhakti poetry, Sikhism, and Jainism. He was introduced to Jainism not by the Jains themselves, but by the Vaishnava Pandits uh, with uh, whom he worked. Uh, the, uh, the most important part of the Jain collection was collected by uh, Alfred Fouché on behalf of his uh, teacher, Emile Sonar. Fouché had contact with Indian pandits uh, during the scientific mission he led in northwest uh, India. He met Gauri Shankar in Udaipur and Bhagavan Das Kevaldas uh, in Mumbai. Uh, the latter is well known for his key role in uh, providing the Western libraries with Jain materials, as uh, Professor uh, Nalini Balbir pointed out. Around 60 manuscripts uh, entered the National Library at the very end of the 19th century, and more than 300 manuscripts were given to the library after uh, Emil Sonar's death in 1928. The last Jaina document that entered the collection is um, Gujarati Adhaidvipa, uh, purchased by the library in 2016. So, uh, let us now uh, go into some detail. Um, Anquetil du Perron is not uh, considered as a Jain scholar, but he is the first uh, French scholar to deal with a Jaina text, namely the Abhidhana Chintamani Namamala by uh, Acharya Hemachandra. Uh, taking advantage uh, of his stay in Gujarat in the 1750s, he bought an old copy of uh, the Sanskrit dictionary of synonyms to help him master the language. The history of Jaina manuscripts in Paris, uh, as you can see, begins under the, the, the Aegis of Beauty uh, with this uh, careful decorative opening page or uh, Chitra Pristika. En côté du Perron uh, put his signature before librarians wrote the shelf mark and put the stamp on it. Now, this copy is a paper party manuscript that shows the standards of the Gujarati Rajasthani manuscript culture. Now, the margins are separated with a triple red line and allow the reader to make notations. A blank space in the middle of the folio is a reminder of the use of the palm leaves that were bound together with a string passing into a hole. The initial sign Bhali opens the text before the salutation to the supreme gurus it has the, the genus. The text itself is written with black ink only in the scriptura continua, uh, or continuous uh, script. The verses numbers are highlighted with a red powder. A marginal notation in Ankoti Duperon's hand indicates that he used it as a kind of a Sanskrit dictionary. You have the detail on the slide. We are also fortunate that this uh, first Jaina manuscripts uh, contains a dated and detailed uh, colophon. In her record description, uh, Professor uh, Nalini Balbir showed that the date is written with the chronogram Bhuveda Muni Chandra 1471, equal to Samvat uh, 1741 when reversed, 
equal to a 1684 uh, common era. It was written in Ahmedabad by a scribe named Hastiruchi, who could be the same person as a religious uh, Shvetambara of the Tapagache. Now, this record uh, shows the importance of uh, doing such detailed descriptions. One can also note that the text was written during the rainy season in the months of Shravana, during the Chaturmasa, uh, that is the very uh, moment for the monks to copy manuscripts. Angotil Duperon uh, asked a scribe to take a copy of the previous manuscript, uh, leaving some lines blank so that he could include his French uh, translation. This manuscript is then a contemporary copy of the letter, reprodu reproducing even the colophon with the same uh, words and, and date. Uh, Ancotil also bought an old copy of a commentary uh, on the laws of Manu, uh, copied by a Jaina scribe, I uh, showed by the Jaina uh, Nagari used, uh, the initial Bele sign, the Jaina Om, etc., uh, that are all the marks of uh, the Gujarati uh, Jaina manuscript culture. The second name that appears in the this uh, short history is not uh, known to Indologists. Uh, Charles Dochoa was a young merchant of uh, Southwest France, a founder of travels on poetry. He came to Paris in uh, 1840 to study Hindustani and Persian at the School of Oriental Languages with Professor uh, Garcin de Tassy. He wanted to write a history of Indian literature and asked the French Ministry of Public Instruction a grant to collect manuscripts and books in India. He went to Maharashtra, where he collected more than 300 works. Uh, beside the Marathi poetry and the Sanskrit literature, uh, Charles de Choa showed a keen interest uh, in the Jain tradition. In order to explore in greater detail this religion, he asked the pandits with whom he worked closely in uh, Mumbai and uh, Pune for a copy of the most important Jaina text. Uh, quite logically, the pandit first delivered him a copy of the Kalpa Sutra. At the end of the copy, one finds a colophon indicating the, the place where the copy was uh, made, uh, the name of the patron, and the date uh, the copy was uh, completed. But the day well uh, on the crown of this Ochoa collection is uh, certainly uh, this uh, undated uh, but an old copy of the Naya Dhammakarao. The paleography and the general layout of the manuscripts invites to date it from the uh, 15th or 16th century. This text is the sixth Anga of the Shvetambara Canon, written in Ardhamagadi Prakrit, uh, with a Sanskrit marginal commentary on the first folios. Here again, one uh, can see the typical structure of a paper a poti manuscript. But canonical texts were not the only ones uh, in the Ochoa uh, collection. His interest in poetry and narrative literature pushed him to gather some representative works uh, of the Gujarati literature. One example is this Mahabala Malaya Sundari composed in 1718 by a Kanti Vijaya, whose name appears in the colophon, as well as in the vers versified Prashasti that appears uh, at the end of the work. This kind of prashasti uh, is interesting from the perspective of a history of Indian literature, because the notion of an authorship is inscribed in history and uh, become clearly uh, visible. Kanti Vijaya is a Shvetambara monk of the Tapagat. He is also the author of hymn and uh, devotional texts. So to a set of uh, eight Jaina uh, works in the Ochoa collections, uh, one can add two manuscripts that were copied in a Jain scriptorium. They are poems composed in Brajbasha in the 17th century, the Madhumalati Kata by Chatur Bujdas, and Madhav Anala Kama Kundala by Moti Rama. These two manuscripts have the same layout. The folios are taken vertically to form a codex format manuscript. The colophons are written in Gujarati and link the manuscripts to the Jain tradition, 
as since the scribe reveals his identity, uh, as well as uh, that of the uh, person who commissioned the copy. Completed on Sunday, 11 August uh, 1822, uh, the copy of this manuscript was followed a few weeks later by the second manuscript written by the same Bhaktivijaya in uh, Palanpur, Gujarat. The reading of these colophons enables to link these two copies to a set of manuscripts ordered by the same uh, Captain William Miles that are kept in the Cambridge University Library, uh, which were fully described uh, by uh, Nalini Balbir. So the most uh, extensive and uh, visible part of the Jaina manuscripts collection in Paris is uh, represented by the manuscripts collected by uh, Alfred Fouché on behalf of his teacher, Emile Sonal. Fouché came into contact with Indian Pandits during the scientific mission he led in Northwest India. His um, encounter with Bhagavan Das Kevaldas uh, in Mumbai was decisive. Thanks to uh, Kevaldas, he collected an initial batch of 61 Jain manuscripts, which entered the National Library in 1899. They are among the oldest copies preserved uh, at the BNF. Uh, this copy of the Upadesha Mala Prakarana is dated in a colophon to Sambat 1584, uh, 1484, sorry. Uh, this date can be converted to 21 May uh, 1427, Common Era. It has a traditional uh, Panchapata layout with the Sanskrit commentaries written in a smaller script in the four margins and the main Prakrit text in the center. Decorative blank spaces recall the form of the Palmif uh, Poti manuscripts. The Fouché collection shows the great diversity of uh, the Jain literature in both Prakrit and Sanskrit. It contains canonical and philosophical texts, grammars, uh, karma literature, monastic rules, narrative literature, and devotional uh, texts, such as this uh, Sanskrit Chaturmukha Mahavira Stotra, with a Sanskrit commentary on the margins. Here again, the Panchapata layout uh, welcomes decorative red crosses surrounding double circles uh, that recall the string hole of the palm leaf manuscripts. But the most extensive part of the collections uh, gathers thanks to Fouché and Kevaldas uh, was given to the National Library after Amy Stenard's death in uh, 1928. A senar often keep for himself a collection of 300 manuscripts, a mostly Jain. He was a leading Indologist uh, who translated Buddhist and Brahmanical Sanskrit texts uh, and deciphered uh, epigraphical uh, materials in the Brahmi script. Uh, to my knowledge, he did not publish uh, anything specially related to Jain studies. Uh, the manuscripts of these collections were uh, wrapped uh, in brown paper sleeves on which Kevaldas wrote uh, the title of the work, uh, the author, and the number of shloka and lines per pages uh, that determine the price to be paid for the manuscripts. Every aspect of the Jain uh, literature are included in this important collection. One can find old copies that dated back to the early 15th century, uh, like this uh, Prakrit Upadesha Mahala Prakarana by uh, Dharma Das. The date given in the colophon showed in this slide that can be converted as Sunday 18 July 1423 Common Era, which is one of the most uh, ancient uh, Indian manuscripts uh, kept in, uh, in Paris. Um, so we maybe skip this one to jump to the illuminated manuscripts. Uh, there are uh, only, only three manuscripts of the Sonar uh, collections uh, that are illuminated. Uh, this uh, Kalpa Sutra is one of them. Uh, this was uh, fully described by uh, Nalini Balbir in one of her first paper published in 1984. Uh, the Gujarati painting uh, of these late 15th century manuscripts are particularly uh, delicate. 
Uh, another uh, not wealthy manuscripts is a Shantinate Cheritra uh, dated in the Colophon from 1439, Common Era. Unfortunately, the manuscripts uh, suffered from diverse uh, disasters in its previous lives uh, that made it very fragile and unable to be uh, digitalized yet. It is described, uh, by the way, on the, in an article written by uh, Narini Balbir and me. Uh, the third one is a painting of the Yakshini Bhagavati that appears in an undated manuscript, probably from the early 18th century. And the last uh, Jaina work to enter the uh, French uh, collections is the, this uh, Adhaidvipa painted on a piece of cloth that the library purchased in uh, 2016. This two and a half continents shows the cosmography of the Jain. Uh, you can see the small text in Gujarati. Uh, they indicate the dimensions of the world. One can note that the temples in the four corners uh, remain empty of uh, the presence of the Jina, who are us usually uh, represented there. Uh, this document shows the Jain uh, collection in Paris is uh, still alive and uh, open to future uh, acquisitions. So to conclude this brief overview, I would like to, to mention the great uh, care given to the collection of uh, Jain uh, manuscripts at the National Library in Paris. A few years back, the library took uh, the decision to digitalize uh, all the Jain manuscripts, so at the exception of the Shantinath Charitra. Um, and the digitalization process obliges us to foliate every leaf and uh, to work with a conservator before putting uh, the most fragile manuscripts in the careful hands of the, of the photographers. So now every uh, Jain manuscripts are now available worldwide on the Gallica, the digitali digitalized library of uh, the BNF. Uh, the next step will be to achieve the detailed catalog that is an urgent necessity after uh, Berlin, Strasbourg, London, Cambridge, Leipzig, uh, Udine, uh, it is the time for the Paris collections uh, to be uh, known in every, de every details. And I wanted to show here some examples that what uh, can be found. And this project is uh, currently uh, underway. Uh, Professor Nalini Balbir and I would like to complete this task, um, let's say soon. Uh, here are some uh, references uh, directly linked to this uh, to these collections. I'm sorry that it is, of course, a very uh, Balbir petit uh, oriented uh, bibliography, uh, but everyone is welcome to uh, work on this collection, of course. Um, you have my email, so I remain at your uh, disposal in the chat or by email to answer the questions you may have on these collections. And um, I thank you very much for uh, your your attention. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Jerome. Thank you. Um, we said that we would like to to combine the questions uh, and have them all together after our second presentation. Okay. So I have already noted a few questions. I would really would like to ask you. So thank you so much. This was a very impressive um, insight into the the rich collections of the <clears throat> National Library. If you have seen, I, I didn't, you know, I, I said this is the institution to 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 work with and, and continental Europe, you know, in terms of Indian, you know, manuscript culture, miniature paintings um, for us. So thank you very much again, Jerome. Let me <clears throat> move to our Six, a second second um, um, guest and, and, and speaker this evening, Dr. Adrian Plau. Adrian Plau is Manuscript Collection Information Analyst at Welcome Collection in London, where he works on making this collection, manuscript collection, more accessible and discoverable to diverse stakeholders. I really look forward to hear what you mean by that. You know, this question of accessibility, which is um, part of our daily business in the museum. So I'm curious to know more about it. And uh, I 
came to know that you have been particularly working also on the aspect of of digital databases and and um, and manuscripts that is a very interesting uh, topic also you to discuss with you Jerome the how in the digital digitalized world you know we are going to share these these huge databases uh, and how make them accessible and um, so Adrian uh, Plow has contributed in several um, journals and um, he has a, a monthly column on early most modern South Asia poetry for the Norwegian news site Asia Punk. That's something I'm going to, to look in particular because I think that's very interesting. And um, as I said, he is very much into digital humanities and online databases. As I said, that's something we should talk about later. So Adrian, thank you very much for joining us this evening. And I'm looking forward to your uh, presentation. Please, the stage oh. is yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Johannes. And thank you for that very kind and uh, thoughtful introduction. Uh, it's much appreciated. And I'm just going to try and share my screen, which I hope everybody can see now. Uh, and yeah, thank you again, Johannes, and thank you also, uh, Chris, Marielle, and, and Tina for uh, putting all this together and for very kindly uh, inviting me to take part, uh, which I found uh, 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 very nice of you, <laughs> as always. And also thank you very much, Jorn, for your uh, talk just now, which was really interesting, uh, amazing to hear about all the things uh, going on uh, uh, with the, the collections there. I uh, have lots of questions uh, for you later on. So uh, I think there are many who would want to get to the Q and A's, and I think there are many who want to already start getting into the questions. So I'm not gonna uh, be too long here. I think I'll try and be quite quick, actually, just to, uh, talking a little bit to you today about uh, well the Gen manuscripts at Welcome Collection. Uh, I have a bit of an overview of the kinds of points that I'm going to try to to get through, uh, but um, uh, I'm not gonna linger too long with that. I think. For those of you who might not be aware what Welcome Collection is and um, uh, isn't, it is essentially uh, the collections inherited from Sir Henry Welcome, uh, who was uh, an American uh, pharmaceutical entrepreneur of the late uh, 19th and early 20th century, who relocated to the UK uh, and started uh, Welcome Burroughs, a huge pharmaceutical uh, uh, company, uh, which um, at this passing, um, well, it's gone through many different considerations, but I think the most important point here is that it's on its passing in 36 morphed into the Wellcome Trust, which today uh, is wholly a biomedical research funder and which accounts for most of the activity uh, related to Wellcome, actually. Uh, Henry Wellcome himself during his lifetime was also an uh, absolute enthusiast on all kinds of things to do with medical history. I was uh, a very enthusiastic collector of all kinds of objects, um, things, materials uh, of any kind that uh, could speak to his interests of uh, a general museum of, of mankind, um, its uh, history of science and health and medicine. Of course, this was not really realized in his lifetime, uh, and a huge amount of the collection was actually transferred to the Science Museum in the early 1970s. So. As a point we can uh, return to later on, uh, on Johannes, and in large regards to your uh, your reflections there about manuscripts and different kinds of museum collections. Uh, anyhow, uh, I also just wanted to point out that uh, I often see the reference to Welcome Institute uh, here and there, and I'm sadly I must inform you that the Welcome Institute is no more. We are now Welcome Collection, which is on the uh, museum, archive, library, and gallery side of the Welcome Trust Institution, which includes, as you can see, the Welcome Library. So uh, as a manuscript holding institution, there are about, uh, this is quite an old slide, it says rough estimates 25,000 manuscripts. I had a bit of a scoping survey last year, which returned that we have around 22,500 manuscripts. So a bit, uh, not that high a number, but still quite a lot. And of course, quite a huge range of, uh, of, of locations and timeframes. I've also since had to update the, the time range there. It's far more than two millennia. It's actually uh, closer to four millennia. There are some ancient Egyptian texts. A quite large section of all these manuscripts are of course the South Asian ones, around 10,000 all in all. 
which is, uh, of course, a significant proportion of the of the overall whole. So uh, my role is, as you said, manuscript collections information analyst. Uh, and in that role, I'm actually tasked with just creating consistent uh, collections management data across all of these manuscript collections. So uh, wish me luck if you want to. Uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit about that collections management uh, question. I think that also ties a little bit into what you mentioned on, on, on digital humanities and databases. And I think some of the kinds of challenges we face, and I mean, Jerome, you will also be able to tell or share your votes on these kinds of questions. Uh, I mean, there are, of course, all kinds of legacy issues coming with these old, huge, um, and diverse collections. I mean, I'm just picking up a few things here. One is, of course, well, the manuscript inventory that I will point to later on, but there are, of course, the, as you say, some uh, items that might be uncatalogued, but there are also some that might have been catalogued 30, 40, 50 years ago, uh, and maybe they might be due for a condition assessment. Uh, again, now, are they still fit to be, be, be shown? Or, or more dramatically, are we still sure about where they actually are? Uh, another um, related issue, if you will, uh, is the one about the disbursement of cataloging metadata, which does sound very uh, uh, esoteric. But I think actually it relates back to the point you raised, Johannes, about uh, diverse stakeholders. I mean, the fact is that if you want to navigate manuscript uh, uh, collections, you tend to have to look through an enormous amount of different kinds of sources of information. In, in our case, we have some catalogs that are printed. You have some catalogs that, uh, that might not have been printed, but might be circulating in a sort of gray literature kind of format. You have some that are cataloged in one kind of, of collections management database, some that are cataloged in another, so that if you want to find what you're looking for, it's actually quite a lot of work to try and navigate all of this if you come as a non-expert user. So, I mean, this is in many ways quite tied closely with what is our strategic di directive for the access and diversity of inclusion of Arkham Collection, which is currently being updated. But I think some of these points will, of course, continue to stand, and that is these aims of, of having a much broader range of demographic of people uh, being able to access our collections and also of course, a deeper understanding of our own institutional heritage uh, and all the things that that entails. So these are some of the sort of background considerations for all of our work across the war manuscript collections. So I think that's the backdrop at which uh, I've had to turn to consider the gen collections. Some of the ways that we're working with this is to adopt the TEI format, text encoding initiative. I'm sure some of you are very familiar with it. Some might not be. I'm very happy to talk more about that later on. Essentially, it's a very, very uh, uh, changeable, it's very adaptable uh, format, and it's also very handy uh, in that it's it's quite easy to pick up. It's quite easy to, to go on uh, um, uh, changing to one's needs. So it's the one adopted format for cataloging uh, information that we have across all of our uh, manuscript materials now at Welcome. And I believe some of the, uh, the members of the so-called TEI team at Welcome are with us here today. So thank you very much for, for joining us. That's, uh, that's lovely. Uh, I made this kind of slide that I'm not going to go into in a huge amount of detail, but essentially it reveals what we're trying to do and that we try to take all these different kinds of, of, of sources, as you can see, gathering them in a single kind of file and then revealing them uh, uh, online. Of course, the TEI files themselves remain open access. Uh, they can be downloaded and used for all kinds of things. And indeed, we contribute these files to other kinds of aggregate databases uh, uh, of many different kinds uh, of, uh, of, of formats and in different parts of the world. So I can talk more about that later on too, if you're interested. As I said, uh, we also have this manuscript inventory now ongoing, which is trying to essentially check the condition and location of every single manuscript that we hold cataloged or not cataloged. There are all kinds of reasons for doing it beyond, of course, uh, attaining uh, archive accreditation within, uh, uh, within the UK. But also, I mean, to be in a position where uh, uh, it's one thing to have the information and have uh, have all this available on the different kinds of, uh, of, of, uh, of manuscripts, but I think we've all been, or many of us might have had the uh, experience of, of requesting to see something that's on the catalog, but it might not actually be retrievable. We don't want to be there. So this is the background. Uh, I'm sorry that I took a little bit of time, but I think it's important to keep in mind to think of, uh, to, to see the kind of choices that we're making when we're then faced with this Gen manuscript collection, uh, which is actually really substantial, uh, around 2,000 manuscripts all in all, uh, which by my reckoning, uh, please, uh, I'll be very interested in being 
proven wrong in this, but I believe it's the largest collection of Jain manuscripts outside of South Asia in the world that I am aware of. Um, we have quite a lot of fantastic cataloging information on all these uh, uh, performed or, or done by, by the doctors Skarno Bayan Kalpanashet and Dinanath Sharma in the early 2000s. Uh, sadly, uh, none of that was published at the time, and it uh, remains today as mainly these kind of handwritten notes. Again, uh, the kind of grey literature hand list kind of information that I mentioned earlier. I mean, what is clear from all this information is that the, the manuscripts uh, cover an incredible range of genres, of languages, of time frames. I mean, I, I'm uh, quite purposefully not going into looking into the specifics of the collection too much in this detail uh, uh, here. But one thing I do want to point out, I'm just going to change the slides so you can see this beautiful uh, illustration from uh, a 15th century uh, Apo Bramsha uh, Yashoda Charit by, by Raidu. Uh, which is one of the most uh, famous uh, manuscripts from this collection. I think there is, on the whole, um, a kind of an assumption that uh, Welcome Collection, given its uh, its, its medical uh, um, focus, its, its its emphasis on science, on, on on medicine and health, that the collection naturally will reflect that, and they're mostly approached by people wanting to see things on medicine, things on health. But uh, the reality is that the collection was gathered in a far more uh, expansive way than that. And there are enormous amounts of material, not just in the Jain manuscript collection, but otherwise as well. Uh, that must not necessarily speak to, to those uh, uh, themes, or at least not in, in, in very obvious ways. So we have lots of devotional material. We have lots of storytelling uh, uh, material, uh, particularly in 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 the uh, in in early modern North Indian languages. Lots of Braj uh, Bhasha, uh things like that. So a quite broad range. So the question arises: how to uh, to uh, how to manage a collection like this, and also to do it within uh, the context of also managing everything else. Uh, um, so that that was been the challenges I've had in this kind of role over the last couple of years. And one thing that came up that gave me the opportunity to focus more specifically on the Gen Manuscript Collection was this Headley Fellowship uh, by the, uh, given by the Art Fund, uh, uh, the Cultural Funding Institution of the UK, uh, which uh, uh, put out a call. Uh, I was very happy, um, lucky and fortunate and honored to receive and to, to, be, to, be, to be successful uh, in this. I've been working on it over the last year, and I'm, I'm wrapping it up as we speak. Uh, these sort of stated aims of, of those fellowships, and I was particularly interested in the, the last uh, uh, two pain, uh, points there on interrogating collections and exploring how they could be more relevant to communities. And the project that I put together and put forward uh, had these uh, particular outcomes, which I'll talk a little bit more about, and I'm, I'm sure we'll have things to say on. Uh, in the Q&A, but I think the things I want to flag here is, is on the one hand, uh, uh, this cataloging work of the Dr. Shet and uh, Ashama to create uh, high visibility, searchable online information, digitize multiple of the manuscripts, um, which is in the one sense, uh, part of the workflow that we have already for our manuscript collections at Welcome Collection. I think this project has simply provided a bit of the uh, time and space to to, to prioritize uh, the Gen manuscripts, but of course you can see that there are also points there uh, around around repatriation, which I'll get a bit more into uh, in, into detail with there by talking from firstly a little bit about the provenance of these manuscripts, and I'm going to just share you with you this uh, slide uh, of uh, of two men. Uh, so. Uh, Henry Welcome in his lifetime, when most of the active uh, um, collecting happening uh, happened, of course, a huge amount of it was through uh, purchases at London auction houses. Uh, very often, very often we'll find uh, these, these references to purchase that Stevens purchased as, uh, uh, at, at various kinds of, of auction houses, many of which now no longer operate. But uh, uh, Welcome also employed several uh, full-time purchasing agents whose jobs were to essentially travel around the world. And of course, that meant also the colonized world purchasing uh, material uh, in, in, in huge amounts on behalf of, of Henry Welcome. Uh, and the two of the most prolific ones when it comes to South Asia are portrayed here on the left. You see Captain Peter Johnson Saint, and on the right you see uh, Dr. Peramal, who was a Punjab-born uh, physician who spent uh, around 10 years uh, in an uninterrupted uh, travel journey uh, uh, through, uh, through South Asia, 
purchasing uh, uh, manuscripts. So I'm going to just look uh, in a little bit detail in the kinds of uh, practices that they were part of. So it's no secret, uh, except that it's perhaps a well-kept secret, that uh, the majority of the Gen manuscript collection at Welcome is actually uh, coming from one single acquisition, uh, around 1,200 manuscripts. We have uh, this uh, actually um, documented in a quite high degree of detail. Uh, all these uh, files that I'm sharing here are also uh, digitized and they're open access if anybody would like to read them so themselves. I can share the links to them afterwards. This is a letter from Peramal uh, going back to uh, Thompson, uh, one of the uh, high administrators of, of, uh, welcome, of the, collection, the Welcome Collection at the time, describing his, uh, his, uh, the, the process of purchasing these manuscripts from uh, a temple. He doesn't actually say exactly where it is, except that it's in the country of Malva. Uh, makes it quite clear that uh, he's able to strike a deal with a younger priest in the temple uh, that might not possibly be supported by, uh, uh, by the higher up uh, uh, people of the temple. And also uh, comes with phrases along the lines that if it were in learned hands, they would not part with it at any rate, not so cheaply. Uh, Thompson wrote back, said, try and get it cheaper still. Uh, and they ended up getting it at the very, very, very low price indeed, uh, which they knew were low because we also have the uh, receipt for the insurance that they opened for the collection before they shipped it back to the UK, which was four times what they actually paid for it. Um, on the other hand, you have Peter Johnson Saint, uh, who's quite an interesting figure in his own right, and he was a huge part of the early history of Welcome Collection. Um, what's fascinating is how little has been communicated on what he did before he joined Welcome. Uh, there's uh, uh, an otherwise brilliant volume on, on the history of, of, of Welcome Collection from 2009. That mentions this in, in the sentence to the right there. Uh, uh, he played hockey for Cambridge uh, for his regiment in India. You can see on the left-hand side uh, his CD uh, that he submitted to Welcome uh, immediately after the First World War when he joined Welcome. Uh, and it reveals quite clearly that he actually spent almost his entire adult life in uh, the British Indian Army, uh, fighting uh, in, uh, on its behalf uh, in, during the First World War and rising uh, into the ranks in the British Indian Army to become the uh, cantonment magistrate for the cantonment of Sitapur in 1914. Uh, he also produced uh, copious amounts of, uh, of notes and information on his travels uh, when he eventually went purchasing for, uh, uh, for Welcome. Uh, and it was very clear that he made use of all his contacts in the British Indian Army in, in all kinds of ways, and also had a quite bullying approach to, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to bartering in the field. There are more than one instances of, uh, of sellers left, uh, uh, left in tears, having felt they had to part with things at a far too low price. So uh, that was a look into the past, uh, having a quick look into the future and these questions of restitution. I mean, there are all kinds of things that can be said. I want to not go on too long here, but rather open the Q&A because I'm sure there are all kinds of things people want to talk about. Uh, what's really influenced me over the last year as I have the time and opportunity to get to do some reading is this, uh, this uh, idea of the typology of taking, the different kinds of taking. Uh, I'm sure uh, Jerome will be familiar with lots of this because it comes from the Sars Savoy report that's so influential in the French uh, uh, cultural discourse. Uh, Hicks, of course, uh, in his very popular book here in the UK, uh, looked into these kinds of taking and created this kind of list of different kinds, uh, not necessarily in the terms of of different kinds of, of, of severity, but, but just as a typology. Uh, and then, of course, you have uh, these things such as scientific collecting, ethnographic collecting, and also instances of barter, purchase, and commissioning, uh, which in today's discourse, I feel like there can often be a, a, a question between, I mean, uh, you know, uh, loot or, 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 or fair purchase, but in reality, there is a far more tangled, uh, uh, more landscape to engage with around these conversations. And I think the question of morals is important. Uh, this is an excellent book by the British legal scholar Alexander Herman, uh, which is a quite short read that I recommend for those who are interested, where he also makes the claim or the, or the argument that restitution, while not being uh, a legal term, does evoke notions of justice. Um, uh, every claim ultimately seeks uh, redress for a wrong. Uh, so there's an element there that I think is important to, uh, to engage with on some level. 
So uh, I can talk much more about all this, and I'm sure we will shortly, but I think uh, the main outcome that uh, I want to share uh, from the work that I have done over the last year, thanks to uh, an enormous amount of generosity uh, and consideration and, 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 and time from members of the UK Gen community, particularly represented by, by uh, the One Gen Umbrella Organization and Mehul Sangrajka there, uh, who I think might be on the call with us today, which has led to this statement uh, between the Institute of Genealogy um, and Welcome Collection that was uh, made public uh, just uh, a month or two ago, which I'm not going to read out, but uh, which essentially, as you can see, uh, uh, makes public the fact that we've had all these conversations towards the restitution of these uh, collections uh, to the Institute of Genealogy as it's represent acting as a representative of the Ukrainian community that many practical questions uh, uh, um, remain, uh, but uh, also that we want to highlight that the restitution should be an open process, uh, which is the beginning of a long-term relationship, hopefully, or I'm sure it will. Uh, and that we also wanted to highlight that it actually is about writing a wrong. It's about uh, talking about an ethical acquisition and also an ethical keeping in a sense in that um, collections like these might have been purchased 100 years ago, but then not actually catalogued or been made accessible whatsoever uh, in the intervening century. And finally, uh, how in the process we want to learn from the Jain principles of moral um, and spiritual health in, to realize Welcome Collection's own goals of uh, a world where everyone's experience of health matters. So uh, lots of stuff there. Uh, I'm not going to linger on it. I'm just going to say thank you. Uh, um, uh, I'm sure uh, there are all kinds of questions uh, for both uh, Jerome and me. So thank you uh, for listening. Um, and thanks again for inviting. I'm going to stop sharing. Uh... Thank, thank you very much, Adrian. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I got one, one question. Um, to Adrian, but before we, we get into the Q&A um, part of this evening, I would like to share a link um, with, with you, which, uh, you know, the Museum Riedberg is not collecting manuscripts as such, So, but we do have illustrated Jain manuscripts because of their paintings, because they're beautiful and we are an art museum. So, and we did an animation of the Kalpa Sutra, of the life story of Mahavir, um, and, and included this animation in our collection. We wanted to make this manuscript more accessible to audiences who otherwise, you know, would not understand what these texts are for and how how to read them and how to see the pictures in them. So I think we share this link and um, thank you for doing that, um, I'm Chris. So I come back to, to the questions. So there's one to um, Adrian. And uh, the question is, you mentioned this collection of manuscripts which came from one temple. Which temple was that? Could you please just reconfirm? Yeah, uh, it all came from one temple. Um, I mean, that is the question uh, of questions in many ways. And I wish I had the answer, but I don't actually. Um, uh, uh, we don't know which temple that was. Uh, um, I think it's quite striking uh, that um, uh, in his letters, Peramal is normally quite uh, um, careful about staying where he is uh, and what, what's, the, what's the place from which he gets something when he, he makes a purchase. In this case, he is actually being very vague, and he says this general district. Uh, um, he also moves quite a bit around at the time, so the letters uh, are never... He puts a date or, or location from where he's written the letters, uh, and he's traveling around Punjab, but uh, he's quite clear that he never has written a letter from where mm -hmm. he got the, the collection. And I think, um, is it because uh, there was something he simply didn't want to 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 be recorded i don't know uh but uh but, but we don't we don't know the exact site of 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 the, of of the temple and i think i've been trying to look a fair bit into it but i also know that there's been a lot of migration of of gens 
in Punjab, of course, following uh, for seven. Uh, so um, thank you. I, I don't thank know. you for this this answer. There's another question which I think I would like to address you both because it's actually quite um, interesting to ask what is what do we mean by saying giant manuscript? What is the definition? Does this also contain include include non giant works? What what is it? What is what are giant manuscripts? What are we talking about? I think to in a broader sense, I think it would be nice if you could both give a very short, precise answer. What is it? Uh, yeah, so I would give a very short. I, I tried to, to give some elements in my presentations uh, by saying that um, uh, I count also uh, as Jain manuscripts, uh, the manuscripts that were uh, copied in a Jain scriptorium in Jain temples, even if the works uh, copied are not Jain text. And we have uh, several examples uh, even of um, the, the Veda, for example, we have copied of the uh, commentaries on the Veda, mm. uh, but uh, with um, the, all the signs that um, is representative to the Jain um, manuscript culture, such as the Bhale sign or the benediction to the Jinas. Uh, and in the colophons, uh, it is very clear that the copyists are uh, Jain uh, monks. Uh, and the manuscripts uh, are copied in uh, Jain uh, temples. So, yeah, I count them as a Jain manuscript sculpture. I, I think we we can define this as a Jain manuscript sculpture. Yes, to to uh, check uh, every manuscripts that are produced in this kind of uh, milieu. But it is my answer. Maybe mm -hmm. thank you, <laughs> Adrian. Something to to complement. Oh, I think that, that's, that's a, great, a great definition that I had not thought about. So thank you very much for that, Jerome. I think thank I just have, I have something to, I mean, I think that the two thoughts to have is is that, uh, uh, well, on the, the, we also know that there was, uh, of course, a quite uh, uh, active scene of, of Jain lay people writing poetry of all kinds of things that might have been written uh, and posted settings outside the temple. Um, but uh, uh, the, many of those manuscripts eventually made their way into the temple anyhow. Uh, I think another interesting example I want to put forward is, uh, is because, well, saying that there are not so many medical texts, there are, of course, some I welcome collection. Uh, there are some I worked a fair bit on. And that is uh, what well, is, to my uh, knowledge, the first uh, vernacular medical treatise in, in, in Hindi, uh, which is a late 17th century text, the Ved, which was composed by uh, uh, a Jain uh, um, and the later ascension actually removes uh, uh, all the references to being composed by a gem, uh, which is really interesting. Uh, it's 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 this quite purposeful. Uh, he mm -hmm. gives a few. There are a couple of instances where he says, "Well, I'm I, hello, I'm a gem," uh, essentially, mm -hmm. uh, and the, 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 this is this is my way of practicing it. And of course, these are just phrases, stock, stock phrases that are changed to much more generic Hindu style uh, phrases. Uh, and then it does the manuscripts are in a sense no longer Jain. So that's really interesting. But on the other hand, mm -hmm. uh, they didn't have to do anything more either to change it, right? Because it was a medical treatise more than it was a Jain treatise. Right? So uh, it, it begins in it, it ends up being like what 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 are you really mm -hmm. uh, looking for in a sense? And I think a lot of these these uh, categorizations are end up being quite arbitrary. Uh, mm -hmm. Those. That text, so course. thank you, thank you for adding this this complexity and and the dynamics of what you know, yeah. um, how a definition can 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 change and rec regarding you know to the different contexts in yeah. these where these texts appear and are used. I would like to to add here another question related to to the manuscripts, the physical, the the objects, and the question here is um, comes. Um, do these um, manuscripts contain the date of the acquisition? So I, I think I would broadly, you know, say, ask what kind of information about the provenance, about dating the manuscript, the colophones and different hands giving signatures on it. What kind of information about the history of an object um, could you identify? If you could just maybe give a very nice you know, significant example of how you can 
get into the history through some of these small details noted somewhere. Maybe Jerome to start. Uh, yes, sure. Um, it is a very fascinating uh, word for me, uh, and uh, there is, there are all these uh, paratextual uh, material, paratexts, uh, which um, are clues and um, to 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 help us investigate how the manuscripts came to to the library from the provenance, and the, it is uh, the history of the manuscripts that uh, that is uh, involved here. So it's uh, fascinating to follow this history. And um, so the, the dates of the, where, uh, at uh, uh, which the, the, the manuscript is copied is often uh, written in the colophon, of course, um, but uh, the date uh, of the purchase is sometimes uh, written on the, on, the, on the sleeves that uh, wrapped the, the, the manuscripts sometimes. Um, one can see um, uh, some, uh, uh, the number of the of the of the the grand agram, the number of the shloka, um, uh, the number of uh, line per pages that uh, allow uh, the, the the seller to fix the, the the price to the manuscripts. So there are every yes kind of uh, signs and paratext on the manuscripts or around the manuscripts. Um, and the second tool to to determine it, uh, all these elements are the registers. Uh, so there, 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 there are registers for the, the donations, for the buyings. So this is an uh, administrative archive of the library, uh, which can, can be very ancient, and who can also give uh, very uh, interesting details to determine these uh, provenance uh, issues. Thank you. Adrian, anything to, to add here? I think yeah. that's quite, quite well here. So yeah. thank yeah. you, Jerome. Yeah. Um, I would like to to come to uh, another question, which um, or a request rather, which comes from from John Court, and uh, he's now we move into the the question of digital uh, archives, and he said, um, isn't there a danger that when you put more and more online material, um, make it accessible? And at the same time, reduce access to to the original to the objects. Isn't there kind of a challenge for scholars to to work with the original material? Um, it shouldn't be that you know, in providing only the digi digitalized data that you reduce access to the originals. I think this is a kind of request um, which he he. It's it's less less than a question. It's a request he wanted to share with us, which I think we all can can take forward and and I think we all agree it doesn't mean you know having a digital um, image doesn't mean that you can't access the original anymore so I mean we could we need to have these balanced um, accesses um, let us shift to this area of of, of of questions related to restitution and repatriation which has been I saw here some welcoming notes and 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 people seem to be happy that um, this is uh, that's a practice. I think we are all now how complex these issues are, you know, across museums across the world, and um, that that there are no easy answers and black and white, um, you know issues it it is it, one needs to discuss this in, in 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 detail and there's for example um john cord who uh, found it difficult to imagine that you restitute something to a temple or an institution which doesn't exist anymore so you should rather than speak in terms of donating it some you know some books to in a third party now in India, which doesn't represent the original mm. owner, I think these are general questions of of you know they're they're so complex in terms of legal ethic mm. um, uh, dimensions. I, I'm afraid that we might not, if we get into these things, it might be a completely different um, now you know area we're getting in because these are really um, difficult questions, but. Um, one question, for example, Narendra Parson is asking, is there a 
digitization done um, of the manuscripts in the Bandaris in India? I think that's a that's an interesting question. Any, do you know, Jerome, Adrian? Oh, actually, I'm in contact uh, with the, the National Mission for Manuscripts in India. And um, they, they, they do a very important uh, work to digitalize uh, private collections and uh, institutional collections in India. Uh, so um, I don't know precisely if uh, there are giant bandars uh, engaged in this program, but uh, I'm sure it, it can be. It can be because uh, it, it, it is also open to uh, private uh, collections uh, that are very numerous and uh, very important in um, in in, uh, in numbers and uh, in in the quality of the manuscripts preserved there. So so yes, I think this is interesting. But the collections in India are uh, of course uh, huge and um, yeah and challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I can just add to that. I think there are many people on the call here today who have much more up-to-date information on that than what I do. Uh, um, but I, of course, the, there are institutions like the, uh, the Upper Ramsha Sahitya Academy in in in, uh, in Jaipur and, and several in Delhi uh, that, uh, of course, organize these things uh, uh, and, and have huge digitization efforts ongoing in different kinds of ways. So, so yeah, there 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 is, uh, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. That kind of drive. I just want to add to that also in terms of the point that John made on, on digitization. I think there's also something that I mean we have an in-house digitization department. I think one thing that also needs to be acknowledged is that uh, uh, simply digitizing a manuscript and putting it online, uh, if you don't have any much, much on kinds of information uh, what is it? All you have is that you have hundreds of digital images, right? So I mean, it, it is an immense effort of, of actually making that up to uh, 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 manageable, searchable, findable, uh, and, exactly. and, and understandable. So I mean, uh, there are many examples of uh, thousands of things that are digitized, yes. but that doesn't mean we know what it is, right? Yes, yeah. absolutely. May may I add, you know, this is something it's um, in regards to, to we, you mentioned some archives of, of scholars here. We mentioned, you know, some great giant scholars who who left us uh, this year. And uh, I think the concern, the question is what will happen to their um, archives. And there are some Jain scholars, um, you know, from the past where the, their photographic archives are with some people, some individuals somewhere in some apartments, and they're sitting on thousands of images. And I see this more and more happening. And I think that the, the question really is um, how do we, are going to to deal with this challenge in a sustainable way because you know i'm not talking only about the the digital space the terabytes and 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 having you know all these images photographs uploaded but also the 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 human resources to to put them in a database and and reference them and and give you know make it make this accessible you can't manage 2000 images of of, of if you don't have a key to use and to you know to distinguish and and connect them so this is i think a huge challenge we are going to face and um i you know recently just just over the last two months i was offered three collections on of of indian on indian art sites ethnographic chain sites etc of of thousands of images so um, I said thank you very much. I mean, but the our museum would, would not be able would not be able to manage this without additional resources and and massive um, funding. So these are the issues. You know, how do we are doing this collectively mm -hmm. uh, across borders? Um, you know, in a in a in a global global context. I think this is something we need to really discuss seriously. Mm -hmm. um, there was a um, some um information you know someone insisted that we should uh, acknowledge that the institute of genealogy catalogs of the british library they are now available on on giantpedia maybe chris you want to share this link which was sent to us um a question to to adrian there, there are some there were some people who felicitate you for for your work which i'm happy to <laughs> repeat here but there's a question 
Um, are there, and Eva de Klerk is, is asking, are there any plans for restituting other parts of the welcome collection? Um, uh, yeah, uh, thank, thanks, Eva. Uh, good to, uh, good to um, know you're here and with us today. I hope you're well. Um, yeah, there is, um, and, and, and there are parts that are, uh, have already been restituted. Uh, and then we're talking about welcome collection uh, as a whole, uh, because given it's um, it's uh, it's remit. Uh, it of course holds quite a lot of human remains, uh, which of course then also falls under the Human Tissue Act uh, within the UK. So uh, so we have several quite recent instances uh, of, of of restitution uh, of those kinds uh, of of materials, and uh, um, and we have uh, a designated person of staff who who deals uh, with these and other kinds of collections of of this kind. Uh, of course, uh, this kind of project is is a bit of, of a pilot uh, uh, in this uh, uh, in this landscape, but uh, I'm sure uh, it will not be the only one. Right. Thank you, Adrian. It's there. Trying to check. There's Akash Dain said that the Jain Vishwa Bharati Institute in Lanun has more than 10,000 manuscripts and around 25,000 digitized copies. So I think this is just an additional information to this question. But may I, may I, um, you know, ask you, how do you, um, if you could think, you know, and, and, and project the, think about the future how do we are going to to face the uh, or to to find solutions to to this huge challenge of of um digitizing these these enormous archives of 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 scholars and and photographic archives how, what, what would be your suggestion adrian well, well, Since um, you are in digital humanities so strong so well, uh, um, well i'm I, I think there are several things to consider. Uh, uh, we've, we've done a bit of sort of experimental work along these lines because Welcome received the collections of, of Jan Gerrit Meulenbelt uh, some years ago, uh, which is very, very substantial, um, um, which uh, now sits with Welcome Collection. Um, and for that, there was uh, uh, a pilot project being developed where we essentially uh, uh, we would take a photo of the title page of every single book, uh, and then it would be OCR'd and uh, and 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 then compared to some of the main online uh, uh, digital um, library catalogs, uh, so that that would hopefully give the sort of the base level minimum viable kind of information needed for there to be some cataloging record of every single item. Uh, well, I think we are still hoping to move forward with that, but of course. Uh, challenges arise instantly in that these OCR uh, uh, programs are typically not able to, the, you can tell them which language they should be looking for, but they can't necessarily deal with two different languages on the same page. So then you of course have uh, uh, a Sanskrit text with the Hindi commentary uh, and things like that. And you get, get very sort of uh, fussy uh, results that mean that you might end up doing just as much, uh, spend just as much time checking it manually uh, as you would have just doing it yourself in the old school way to begin with. So I think uh, I think there are some definite sort of challenges on the road, but I think there's another consideration that's of equal importance and that is I think that uh, it's easy with all the tools available now to get carried away and produce essentially a, a, a degree and scale of data that is so overwhelming that it actually becomes hard to, harder to find things. I mean, it's very, it, we get to the point where we have almost completely digitally replicated the entire contents of a manuscript, but we have, we have the digitized image, we have a transcript, we have a bibliography, we have scholarly notes, uh, and we have the translation, everything, right? Uh, and, and if we are going to travel in that direction again, we get to the point where um, uh, uh, you need a very high degree of, of, of expertise uh, to simply figure out right, what, uh, what what manuscripts does a, any kind of institution have in, in a given language, for instance, eh? uh, because there's so much uh, uh, 
extra information to wade through. So I think there's this sense that um, minimum viable description, again, which is part of the spectrum standard in the UK for inventories, I do think is quite helpful. And it's the approach we've taken with a lot of the manuscript information we do have. Things like uh, title, uh, uh, title, date, uh, creator, where available, uh, uh, current condition, and ideally current location, and then maybe not so much more uh, so that people can find it uh, and, and then take it from there. Uh, mm. But uh, that, that's one way, Thank and you. I think there are many others. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Any comments from you, Jerome, or...? Oh, no, I just want to add that, uh, that everybody knows that, that uh, the South Asian collection are very challenging because there are many languages and uh, many scripts also. If you know Sanskrit, it is um, sometimes very difficult to read on uh, other scripts than uh, Devanagari. So you have to improve your knowledge in, uh, in every way. And I guess that oh, it is my uh, experience that um, uh, to build uh, teams to work on uh, particular subjects are uh, very um, important and uh, and useful to work on uh, particular aspects of uh, of collections. But of course, it is very challenging. Right. I got a a, a note saying that uh, Peter Flügel is working on a project that is in the the that they are digitizing Jane Argam's ma manuscripts. Um, so I think there, there are many, 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 um, you know, initiatives and, and uh, I'm, yeah, I, I wonder, you know, I wonder how the, the different standards, the different ways of, of processing these data, you know, it's, it's, and how accessible these data are, in fact, really in, in these different databases, you know, around the world. That is that's definitely interesting to to discuss. I think we have another seven minutes to go, Chris. Am I right? Yes. More, so I would like to 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 open the floor, you know, maybe for some more questions um also from from our group. I think we have the Q and A's which came in. I think we more or less dis discussed them. Or should we should we address the get into the the repatriation um, you know debate? But I feel like it's I've, it's it's, it's going there is, beyond. <laughs> yes, yeah, if, please, if there Marie. is time, I have just a very small question for Jerome, mm -hmm. and, and my apologies in advance if you've already tackled that topic. It's because um. Uh, Adrian just mentioned that they received very recently the collection of Mullenbelt, and I was wondering um, if you had a very recent uh, donations like that at the BNF, uh, and if that also included uh, some Jaina materials or not. Um, I don't know if I should say fortunately or unfortunately. <laughs> fortunately, nobody uh, dies, so it is the 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 positive aspect of that but uh no there is no there is no not this kind of uh donation to the library for now um and professor balbir uh, gave the um personal collection of her parents uh, these are um printed books uh, of uh, hindi um hindi literature mostly so this is the last um a donation that we we have in this of this kind, uh, but there are no particularly uh, Jain uh, text. It is really Hindi oriented uh, uh, linguistics and uh, literature. But uh, no, we there is uh, nothing of this kind for the moment. But uh, of course, we are open to to donations or things. Uh, yeah, but uh, I don't know if it's the time. Yeah, it's the right time to that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Any, any and yes, if, if I may, I, I just mm -hmm. um if if I yeah if we have well, a few minutes. <laughs> I, I just wanted to, to 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 thank again also Adrian for this uh, historical announcement of the fact that he, yeah this restitution of the 
of the manuscripts to the giant community, whether it should be called or not a restitution. I think um, all the giant communities in the UK are thrilled about that and really eager to, to continue uh, these stats. So I think you have a lot of uh, thank you in the comments. So I just wanted to yeah <laughs> say that uh, to you out loud. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I thank you. <clears throat> I would like to 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 share another link um, through Chris. This is not exactly related to 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 Jain Jainism or manuscripts, but it's a link to a project where we combined um, archives, photographic archives, and objects from our collection. So it's and it's a I think quite innovative um, database which we built where you can go back in time and travel to places and find out which object was bought on which trip by this particular person. And you can search photographs and link them to the data, to other data. So um, I think this kind of project makes these data accessible and and uh, but if you if you um, look around that you will see and you will feel immediately this is there's a huge massive investment of of resources behind right so i wonder you know how whether how, how we can do something similar in in all these fields and areas in the future i think this needs a combined some initiative which goes across um, across institutions and across borders, and I would, you know, I would be more than happy to 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 hear whether there is something, some some ideas which go into this direction, you know, in France or UK, and and um, I, I know that something works in the area of of, of in the domain of libraries and manuscripts. I, I think this is easier and already quite established but coming to to um you know collections of tox textiles bronzes photographic mm. archives i mean there we are kind of um really into um yeah i don't know and i i don't see i don't see uh, solutions there so i would love to get more inputs from your side mm. so with this I think we conclude and and um, thank you, Chris, for sharing um, the link to register for the next dialogue event. And I hope you all do sign up and register immediately. So thank you very much for for your contributions and questions. Um, th there's another final questions maybe. Um, uh, Johannes, have institutions considered donors' requests to refer to smaller museums? I, 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 and there are some other, I think, but it, it's it's not that, I think we have, we will check online. We will see whether we can answer these, these questions directly. So thank you. Thank you all for, for joining this evening. And um, may I hand over to Chris to conclude? Yes, thank you so much, Johannes and Jerome and Adrian for your wonderful presentations and the dialogue. Uh, it was really wonderful and uh, generate a lot of food for thought for us here. I just wanted to briefly show you all the future dialogues event that we showed at the beginning on our website. And I just put this link in the chat so you can see it. Our next event is on February 5th, as Tina mentioned at the beginning, uh, same time, 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Central European time, you can register now and you can also register as you see here for all of our future events. So please feel free to visit our Dialogues website and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you all in the next event. Thank you again, Johannes, for doing such a wonderful job presiding and to my team, uh, Marie Elaine Gorse at University of Birmingham and Tina Beckermans at the Ghent University. Wonderful collaboration. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.